So the astronomy part of the pair of Winter Capital Awards is going to be given by Benjamin Yoakimi from University College London, who's hiding. Now, we're not being mean to Benjamin by not giving him a certificate now, but he actually received his certificate at NAM. Uh, so over to you. Thank you. And it's a pleasure to be here and be able to talk to you about my work. I should say I apologize in advance for the poor sound quality of my presentation. I hope my voice lasts until the end. Um, I'm going to talk about cosmology with galaxy shapes. I try to describe my work in, in simple terms. So what I'm looking at is at faint galaxies in deep, large area surveys of the sky. And I'm particularly interested in the shapes of these galaxies, so an orientation on the sky and an ellipticity. And with that information, which looks like not very much, you can do a lot of galaxy evolution studies and also cosmology, find out about dark energy, the nature of dark matter, and if Einstein gravity, as we know it, is correct. I'm actually not going to talk very much about these cosmological results for the simple reason that currently the constraints that you get from gravitational lensing, which is responsible for effects that um, I'm going to talk about, are not very strong. You would expect much more interesting cosmological results currently from, for instance, the Planck satellite, and results are imminent. Instead, so I'm going to cover that only briefly, instead I'm going to talk about challenges. Challenges to get these very accurate results that we expect from these methods in the near future. We're going to have fantastic cosmological constraints from the ESA Euclid satellite, which is going to be launched in about um, seven years' time, probably, from the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, again, similar time scales. But we also have ongoing large surveys, like the Dark Energy Survey, and they're going to have fantastic constraints, and gravitational lensing with these galaxy shapes is at the core of the programs of all these surveys. But in order to do precision cosmology with that data, a lot of challenges have to be overcome, and that is my day-to-day -day work. I'm going to focus on two aspects, very different areas. One of them is actually wonderfully messy astrophysics. It's galaxies intrinsically aligning and mimicking cosmological signals. I'm going to start with that. So that's astrophysics. And the second part, actually, is pure statistics. It has got nothing to do with astronomy at all. It might actually be relevant to you, possibly, because it should apply to all uh, physics and physical inference that we do. Just to highlight uh, two cases that you come across when you try to do precise measurements. Let's see if that works. Uh -huh. There we go. So a brief introduction about gravitational lensing. It is an effect of general relativity as first correctly predicted by uh, Albert Einstein. Um, he said that large masses curve spacetime as illustrated here and as light always takes the shortest possible path, these are not straight lines anymore, but light rays are bent on geodesics. And this picture here looks very much like the path of light that you would have if there was a collecting lens here, and hence the name gravitational lensing. <coughs> to show you a real example, these are the outskirts of a massive galaxy cluster. The core would be somewhere over here. Lots of elliptical yellowish galaxies. These are members of the cluster. And all these faint dots here would be galaxies in the background at very high redshift, some of them at least. And what you see is, you probably can also see that from the audience, I hope, is these elongated, funny shapes. You wouldn't expect that from a galaxy. These objects are gravitationally lensed by the massive galaxy cluster in the foreground. And to look at the optical and analogon, this is a ball lens, and you see exactly these banana-shaped distortions tangentially around the center of the lens or the big mass there. So this is exactly what we see here as well. Now, you see wonderful effects. That's called strong gravitational lensing. You can actually see that on an individual galaxy. That's comparatively easy to do. I'm not doing that at all. Now, if you want to concentrate, say, on this corner here, it doesn't look very spectacular. You have lots of faint sources. You probably can't see much. If I gave, no, gave you now just this <coughs> postage stamp of the sky and ask you to infer, tell you that there has been, these are probably gravitational lens, these images, and tell you where the big mass was that did the gravitational lensing. 
you may have the idea, well, I can't see much, so how about I just average over all galaxies in that area of sky and see if there's any net orientation of these galaxies. And if you do that, you would indeed probably find that there is a net elongation along here. And you would conclude, well, there either must be the mass there or on the other side. There's this degeneracy. So what you have done is you have used statistics, namely averaging over galaxy images, to infer something about the mass distribution, namely that a big over-density of mass must be either on that or that side. As soon as you use statistics to make inference from gravitational lensing, we are in the realm of weak lensing. And this is what I'm going to concentrate on. What happens is, if you have these weak effects, if you have a circular source, a background galaxy, it is distorted into an ellipse. This is what we call shear, gravitational shear. And the apparent size is also changed. That's what we call magnification. I'm going to concentrate on shear here. So going away from the picture of having one big cluster, now if you just look in the field, an empty patch of sky, you have lots of distant galaxies, faint galaxies, and their light on the way to us is continuously deflected by the intervening large-scale structure. And doing so, they're going to be sheared. So this is a picture, you have a background galaxy, and this is the sheared version. This is massively exaggerated. These effects here are tiny. You have at most 1% changes of these images. And this is a beautifully large galaxy. We're talking about galaxies that cover maybe 10 pixels of your detector. If we do a bit of math here, at least approximately, we can say that the observed ellipticity of a galaxy is just the sum of its intrinsic ellipticity and the shear that you add on top. Now, if we just averaged over the whole sky, you would just not get a signal at all because we assume the universe is homogeneous and isotropic, and so all these effects should average out. What you have to do to get a signal is you have to correlate pairs of galaxy shapes with each other. If you have galaxy pairs which are close on the sky, you would expect them to be subjected to the same shear from similar structures, and so you would expect a, a tiny net correlation of these galaxy shapes. If you average over millions and billions in future of objects, then you get a signal. Now, if we insert that equation here, you see we get four terms. This is a correlation of gravitational shears. That's what we're after. This is the cosmological signal, and it tells us about the, the growth of structures, because we get a projected map of the matter distribution, including dark matter. But it also tells us about the geometry of space, because just as in optics, we have a source, we have a lens, and we have an observer. And the distances, of course, play a role. So we also measure ratios of cosmological distances with that. And that makes this weak lensing here, or cosmic shear as it is called as well, a very powerful probe of cosmology in principle. Now you have got three extra terms here. But what usually seems a reasonable assumption is that galaxies are just randomly oriented on the sky. We wouldn't expect them to all point in the same direction, do we? So that means that this correlation between intrinsic ellipticities vanishes, and there's also no correlation between intrinsic shapes of galaxies and shears on other galaxies. So these terms vanish, and by just doing this, we get the cosmological signal and do nice cosmology with it. I'll come back to that in a minute. Working with that, and this is my only cosmology results slide, is you can do science as, as shown here. This is still the state of the art. It's um, a survey done with the CFHT, Canada, France, Hawaii telescope on Mauna Kea. Uh, it's a 150 square de degree survey. By today's standards, that's fairly small. And again, there are ongoing surveys which, uh, surveys which cover about 5,000 square degrees, and Euclid LSST will cover 100 times this area. But even with this tiny bit, you can, for instance, make a map of the full matter distribution. This is given by the contours here. Light contours would be over density. Uh, dark would be under dense. And this is mostly dark matter. You can't see this, but we can map the gravitational effect of, of this matter distribution. And the white blobs here are binned galaxy light. So this is the light. And you see light traces matter. That's an important conclusion. So you see this, for instance, would be a void, a cosmic void, 
you have overdense structures, so this would be a cluster or a group of galaxies, and you see a lot of light. But you also see areas where there's not much light, and still there's a lot of matter. So presumably, that could be a filament of the cosmic web seen along the line of sight. Interesting science to be done there. You can also look at the signal of weak lensing around individual galaxies. That would be very faint, but you can stack thousands of galaxies on top of each other and look at their dark matter profile. You can look at the abundance of satellites, so galaxies orbiting larger um, satellites. And for the experts, that's, of course, testing our paradigms of cold dark matter and so on and so forth. Again, quite important. And you can do what I would call hardcore cosmology. So this is a test of Einstein gravity. These are two parameters um, that encode deviations from, gravi uh, from Einstein gravity, a change in the Newtonian potential, and a change in the way that lensing of light is done. Uh, zero, zero corresponds to Einstein gravity, and luckily, we're still there. OK, this is the sort of stuff you can do. But now to the challenges. You've seen this equation before, and now I tell you the assumption of setting that to zero is incorrect. The galaxies are not randomly oriented on the sky. They have the annoying tendency to point towards each other, and that's what we call intrinsic galaxy alignments. So how does that come about? There are apparently only very simplistic pictures of that. One of them is called tidal stretching. You have a galaxy forming, of course, in a dark matter environment, and you expect a sort of quadrupole, as I sketched here, due to the surrounding matter structure. And in this quadrupole, you get tidal forces, which squeeze the galaxy together and stretch it in the other direction. And so you would get an elliptical shape like this. If another galaxy is nearby, it would probably get a similar sort of ellipticity, and then these galaxies would be correlated. You can make a similar argument for the angular momenta of galaxies, and that would be applicable to disk galaxies. We expect that gas just spins around, and then we get a nice disk like the Milky Way around this. And again, due to the tidal forces, the angular momenta of neighboring galaxies would become correlated, and so the disk shapes would become correlated. So you get a picture like this. You have an overdensity here and here, and two nearby galaxies will just align with each other. And now if we look at, again, this is a simulation of the cosmic web. These blue galaxies are lensed by this web. So we're looking onto this in, in projection. And if you focus on the green box here, over density, over density, lensed in this direction, that looks exactly like the sketch for the intrinsic effect. So intrinsic alignments mimic the gravitational lensing signal. And we, just by looking at this on the sky, we have no way of telling this apart. Now, this alignment might be very weak, but this probe is very sensitive. And this is illustrated here. Here we have two um, parameters that encode the dark energy equation of state. This would be the offset, and this would be a redshift evolution. This would be a fiducial value. These are forecasts for the Euclid mission gravitational lensing. And the, these ellipses here are just throwing in an intrinsic alignment effect that we think is realistic, and we have various models. And due to that, we have very strong biases up here, up here, and the bias for the red model here is so strong that the ellipse has fallen off the plot. As you can see, right, this, this is huge. This would destroy all sort of uh, cosmology that you can, could infer from this probe. This is a serious issue. So we need to understand better, and we need to mitigate the effect of intrinsic alignments. So one idea that um, we came up with over time is called self-calibration. If you measure the orientations, ellipticities of galaxies, of course you also record their position on the sky. So that information you get essentially for free. And once you have that, you can look at the clustering of galaxies. So you can look at how the distribution of galaxies over the sky. Are there over densities? Are there under densities? And this comes for free. So this is sketched here. So the epsilon would stand for shapes. So we have correlations of shapes. This would be the cosmological signal we are after. And this is contaminated by the intrinsic alignment signals. On top of that, we can now correlate galaxy positions with each other and code it here. 
called clustering. And we can also look at cross correlations between a galaxy position and the galaxy shape. To illustrate that, this measures how galaxies point towards other galaxies with their shapes. This is actually one of the best ways we have to measure the intrinsic alignment effect. Then essentially, the clustering gives us information about galaxy bias. That's just a way of saying how is the clustering of galaxies related to the clustering of dark matter. With that, we can translate the pointing of shapes towards galaxies to a pointing of shapes towards dark matter. And that is exactly the intrinsic alignment effect that we want to calibrate. So these arrows here indicate the way, the direction of self-calibration. If we now introduce flexible models for the intrinsic alignments and the clustering, we get a very massive set of parameters, but since we have a lot of statistics, we can then infer cosmology, intrinsic alignments, galaxy bias jointly, marginalize over these nuisance parameters, and get sound, unbiased cosmology out. And this was demonstrated to, to work, and you recover also the information that you originally expected. That's good news. So we can still do weak lensing. But if we have a physically motivated model for bias and intrinsic alignments in particular, we can also do the opposite thing. We can marginalize over cosmology, and then we get interesting constraints on these alignment effects. And they tell us about how galaxies formed in their dark matter environment. <coughs> Remember, they linked tidal fields at the time of formation to their orientations. So that's potentially a very interesting probe. And so we would like to improve modeling. There has been effort to improve analytical modeling, but since gas physics is involved in the details of galaxy formation, that is actually fairly tricky to do. So one has to rely on simulations. We are now, nowadays re routinely using large cosmological volumes to do n-body simulations, and they beautifully reproduce um, the cosmic web. I've, I've shown you these boxes of simulations before. But in order to get intrinsic alignments into the simulations, we would need galaxies, we need gas, we would need stars, and that is very hard to do. So the way out usually are semi-analytic models of galaxy shapes. So you take an embodied simulation, you have the history of certain structures that have formed, and based on that you have an effective analytic prescription to put in actual galaxies colors of galaxies, brightnesses of color, galaxies, and so, on, and so on and so forth. And we propose to extend this picture by also having semi-analytic prescriptions of galaxy shapes, of morphologies, of orientation. Of course, these are currently very simplistic. We don't have a good idea of how this works. But this gives you an example. This is an ob observation. This is the black line, and the gray area is the uncertainty on that observation. And the colored points are various simplistic models that we imposed um, on the n-body simulation to get galaxy shapes in there. Um, and you see they generally seem to do a fairly good job, surprisingly, given it's that simplistic. So this is, of course, only a starting point. Now we have this framework. We can improve the semi-analytic prescriptions that we put in. And one way forward is to do hydrodynamic simulations, which get better and better, but you can only run them on fairly small volumes. However, you can infer from these, the, for instance, these are distributions of axis ratios of ellipsoidal structures that have, have formed. The uh, blue is for the dark matter structure, the halo, and uh, red is for the corresponding stellar particles, so simple stars, effective star particles. And this is for different mass spins. So we get distributions for all of these. Likewise, these authors, it's a very recent, very, uh, recent paper, have also measured the probability distributions of misalignment between the dark matter structure and the bright star structure on top of that. So we can now use these distributions and inform our semi-analytic models to improve on that. And this is hopefully a way forward to get a better understanding of how intrinsic alignments act and what their signals are. And then finally, of course, to constrain all these models, we need to do observations just one example uh, from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is, uh, covers about 10,000 square degrees of sky, very rich source of information, and various galaxy samples, I don't have time to go into detail, uh, are, are shown here. This is as a function of redshift, so we cover a fair amount of redshift with our samples from 0 to 0 0.7. Likewise, this is in 
absolute brightness, and we cover four magnitudes of brightness very well with these samples. The new work here was this bed sample here. This is the only sample which does not have spectroscopic, so precise information of redshift. And if you don't have that, then your signal washes out due to, due to the uncertainty of positions along the line of sight. And we develop the modeling framework to take this into account. Once you do that, you can constrain a still fairly simple model. Uh, again, this here is, is a power spectrum. All you need to know here is that this encodes the simple picture I showed you earlier, the tidal stretching paradigm. You can make an analytic prediction for that. And then all you add is an amplitude. So that encodes how does an um, elliptical shape of a galaxy respond to the strength of the tidal field. And you add a free redshift scaling with an exponent and a luminosity scaling, so brightness scaling with an exponent. And these three parameters can be constrained very nicely. The dark contours here are all samples together. They are consistent, which is very good news. And um, we actually have now fairly good idea that, for instance, we do have a luminosity scaling, a roughly linear one, and we have an amplitude as well, uh, which is surprisingly strong for these samples of galaxies. Now we can use that, for instance, to make predictions of contamination of surveys. This is shown here. This is, again, a dark energy parameter, and this is a matter density parameter. These are the statistical constraints, two sigma, expected for the Euclid satellite for weak lensing. And these red lines here enclose, I think, 90%, if I remember correctly, of the probability of where the bias in this parameter space could be if you ignore intrinsic alignments. So you see that's all over the place, which is not good. After this analysis, we reduce this to the blue contours here. So, yeah, certainly better, still not good enough. And these black contours here are admittedly daring prediction of what we will be able to do in 2020 when the Euclid satellite is launched. The important thing to notice is this black circle here is smaller than the area of this circle, which means that the correction that we need to apply uh, to correct for intrinsic alignments should be smaller or subdominant to the total error budget of the Euclid mission, which is good news. Um, this is for early types, so red galaxies only. Lensing samples usually contain a majority of blue disk galaxies, Milky Way-like galaxies. And unfortunately, I can't show you beautiful constraints for these because we have essentially no clue what the intrinsic alignment signal is for these galaxies. So there's clearly a lot of work left to do. But I don't have time to cover that. And hence, on to the other topic, much more formula now, I'm afraid, but hopefully something that you've all seen at some point. So, very abstract problem. You have a data vector, let's call it D, and D of them in there. You've covered that from a survey, a measurement, whatever. And then, of course, you need error bars for that. Now, we are in the unfortunate situation that we don't know our error bars analytically. The usual way forward is we run lots of simulations, n-body simulations. Cosmology, of course, we have the additional uh, slight problem that we have only one object to work with. So we create mock universes, NS of them, and then we esti estimate a covariance matrix uh, for our measurements with this sample covariance estimator, which I think you've all seen. The minus one here is because we estimate the mean from the data as well. So nothing unusual there. And then we do inference with that. And usually, you come across a term like this. We call that a chi-square. You could make a Gaussian likelihood, as I've written here. But that's ubiquitous, ubiquitous in, in physics. So what do we have? We have the data minus a model. Same here. And we link that with the inverse covariance matrix here. That looks, hopefully, fairly familiar and unsuspicious. However, strictly speaking, this is not correct or risky to do it. This might bias your parameter constraints. I've written here the better version, not necessarily the correct version, but it's clearly an improvement. The difference is very subtle. <coughs> so here I have written the inverse of the estimate of covariance, whereas here I have written an estimate of the inverse covariance. Now, why should that be different? The reason is, if your data is Gaussian distributed, and that is the simplistic assumption you throw out, otherwise analytic progress is uh, out of reach, then the covariance is Wishart distributed, 
and the inverse covariance, inverse Bishop distributor. This distribution is skewed. And hence, the mean of the inverse of the estimate is not this anymore, but you get a prefactor there. This is well known in statistics. The first paper we could track is from, the, from 1967, and it took cosmologists a mere 40 years to come across that paper and uh, actually become aware that something is horribly wrong in our inference. So you have this bias here, and if you ignore that, this propagates onto your parameter errors that you infer from your likelihood, to be it with Bayesian inference or frequentist methods. doesn't matter. To make it worse, cosmology is now a data-rich science, so the ND is very large. Mock universes are very expensive to produce, so an S should be as small as possible. And then you see what happens in the denominator here. This goes to infinity. It diverges. Once your sim number of simulations is smaller than the number of data, you get a divergence. So to illustrate that, okay, covariance, the mean of the sample covariance is unbiased. We all know that. Fine, no problem at all. If we take the inverse covariance, the mean is biased, as shown by Kaufmann in the first place, and these are simulations, and you see, actually, yep, that happens. This is the size of the data vector, and you see a divergence. What happens is, your covariance is so noisy at this point that it becomes singular and you can't invert it anymore. This is what you see here. Now, if you look at the uncertainty of the covariance, so we are now talking about errors on errors. Again, for the covariance, you know how this scales for a Gaussian case. It's just two times the variance, so nothing unusual here. If you correct for this bias, which we can do because we know the scaling, you still get a divergence of now of the errors of the covariance. And again, it's a 1 over n divergence here. Big problem. You can propagate this now into the likelihood and onto parameter errors. So that could be your cosmology or whatever your desired inference is about. This would be a bias in the error on parameters. And this is an additional scatter in the variance. And if you do nothing, you see you get, again, divergences here. They're all slightly shifted, but if, effectively they're 1 over n divergences. And what this means here, so this is rescaled with the covariance itself, so if you've got 1 here, you have doubled the errors on your parameters just because of uncertainty in your data covariance matrix, which clearly is undesirable. And it, luckily, you see the black lines here, which fit the data points of simulations well. Luckily, we can now completely analytically prescribe these effects and at least for the biases, we, we have now a means of correcting for that analytically. It's actually quite simple once you know how to do it, once you've done the calculation. If you know that, you can, for instance, um, derive requirements on the number of simulations you need to get an accurate data covariance. So if you now, so this is your parameter, this is your parameter error, which is clearly important, and this is your uncertainty on the parameter error with this epsilon here. And if you want 10% accuracy on a Nowadays, cosmological measurements, let's say you have a data point of 100, which is quite realistic. If we take the unbiased case, optimistically, we just need about 200 simulations. Oh, that's clearly doable, no problem. If we go to something like Euclid LSST in 10 years' time, we will have at least 1,000 data points. We have multiple probes, multiple redshift slices, huge data sets, easily several thousand. And clearly, since we're spending billions of, of euros or pounds or whatever on that, we don't want our error bus to be larger than necessary. So we say, okay, the, the additional error due to covariances should not exceed 1%. And suddenly, you need more than 10,000 mock universes to run. That will be impossible even in 10 years' time. So at least now we understand the problem. doesn't mean we haven't solved it. Um, we have solved it. So just briefly, on my last slide, one idea, one way out of this, actually fairly simple. If you ask a statistician um, how to compute such a covariance, probably no one would answer use the sample covariance estimator that we all know, because it is unbiased, yes, it's the only unbiased estimator, yes, but it's extremely inefficient, meaning it produces very large error bars. And you don't care for unbiasedness if your error bars are too large anyway. And this idea is exploited in what is called shrinkage estimation. It's a very general concept, 
But in this context, it simply means a very clever idea of just using a linear combination of a model covariance and your sample covariance, your unbiased one. And we do have models. They're not very good. This is an example from uh, Hilbert et al. This is a log normal model. This is the model. And this is a simulation covariance. And you see the structure is OK. If you look at the amplitude here, it's still a factor of two or so off. But at least the structure is right. And that sort of prior information should be useful. And indeed, if you put that in here, you've got a nice analytic estimator um, derived here. Uh, in this paper, actually, that's not an astronomy paper at all. I think it was biophysics or something, these, these people here. And which essentially means that the data now chooses the weighting. If your model is really bad, lambda will be chosen <coughs> such that you put your weight onto the simulation covariance. If your model is good, this will have a high weight, and hence the noisy part will be downweighted. If, if your covariance is very good anyway, again, it will more rely on this, because it's safer, as this might be biased. This is all encoded in this estimator here, in a very neat way. And just one toy case that illustrates this. So again, this is a plot as a number of simulations, the size of the data vector. This is what you saw before, the diversion case. And these are several estimators, which in different ways take into account that the diagonals are actually zero in this case. And building in this prior knowledge, you see how the error on your covariance matrix is suddenly decreased massively. So by beating down the noise in this way and accepting a hopefully small bias that needs to be verified, of course, you then can decrease, for instance, the number of simulations for cosmology by orders of magnitude, probably. And again, we have to work on the details. So it's, this gives us hope um, that we still can make a case and get recent, decent error bars on our measurements. Okay, so to summarize, I highlighted two aspects of my work. Very different areas. Both are challenges that we encountered preparing our method, which is cosmic shear, gravitational lensing, for precision cosmology. One is in the realm of galaxy astrophysics, its intrinsic galaxy alignments. Itself may be a very interesting probe of galaxy formation in its environment. Quite exciting, very challenging to measure in itself. The second aspect is the estimation of cosmological covariances from finite realizations, this introduces noise, and this is totally from the realm of statistics, has nothing to do a priori with astronomy, and might be even relevant to you, I hope. Thank you very much. So, question time. You did not mention the possibility of uh, correlations that come from telescope, from image distortions in telescopes. Is that because they are under control quite well? No. <laughs> it's just because I don't have time. <laughs> uh, no, clearly. Um, we want, as, as I briefly mentioned, we want to measure the shapes of galaxies which maybe cover 10 pixels. That was not exaggerated. That is really the case. And as you mentioned, if uh, your, your camera has slight distortions, um, that messes this up really very badly. So the modeling the PSF, the point spread function of the telescope, including the ellipticities induced by the system, is of paramount importance. From measuring this from the ground is even more challenging because you have the atmospheric effects, which tend to blur images, so make them more circular. But if you, for instance, have telescope jitter, you again introduce a, a spurious ellipticity, and it becomes very complicated. And that's one of the reasons why we expect the best measurements to be from space. And that's one of the primary um, um, support for, for having a, a Euclid satellite. So that's going to get rid of it. But still, you have wavelength dependence of your point spread function and so on. No, it's by far not solved. It's a very active area of research. Then we have time for one more question, then we need to move on. There was one just in the front. Sure. So, yeah. so uh, you were worrying about uh, <coughs> chance alignments, or not chance alignments, but alignments because of uh, local over densities, render densities. Presumably, locally, of course, it looks just like a lensing signature, but globally, there's a difference. The lensing signature should, should have a curl shape, and the, um, cha this alignment, because of overdensity, should have a divergence shape. So can't you use that global information to tell the two apart? Uh, no, not as such. What, what this does is that the cross-correlation between lensing and intrinsic, which was G called GI here, actually turns out to be an anti-correlation. That's exactly what you referred to, the 
rid of the initial line. But, okay, we have, we have a sign change, but as such, that doesn't help us really. So we have a negative sign, the systematic is, uh, reduces the signal, um, but it doesn't help us to, to reduce this. What does help us is the different redshift dependence. This is the only handle you have in a model independent way to tell these uh, systematics apart. I saw John at the back, so perhaps the final question. <laughs> does a bootstrap resampling of your um, data set help you with this last problem? You don't need to make assumptions about Gaussianity and so forth with that. Absolutely, yes. Um, the problem is, of course, we have very long-range correlation across the sky, right? The, the largest modes of the power of the distribution goes all across the sky. So you never have independent patches of sky that you can use for bootstrapping. And it has been, yeah, it has been demonstrated that actually that causes problems. Uh, the jackknife seems to be slightly more stable. <coughs> Uh, but again, you, you get problems. Uh, again, there's only a finite amount of sky, and uh, to the large scale correlations really cause problems. Uh, so I doubt it's going to be uh, maybe it's a cross check on small scales, but not the general solution. Okay, thank you. Thank our speaker again. <coughs>